Um, let's see if we could this, have the first slide up. So um, I was asked to share with you guys three things, uh, VR, China, and Jaunt. And then um, they told me I have 15 minutes to do it. So uh, it's a big task. Uh, I've been thinking about how to do this. So um, I'm going to try a different, uh, we have uh, three different topics. So I'm going to try to share with them with you in uh, three different types of uh, story form. First one is, what is VR? So I think, you know, we, one of the great things about talking to this crowd as to others, especially bankers, is you guys all know what VR is. I don't have to explain what it is. You have all put on the headset. But when I was thinking about what is VR, I, I took a deeper look, deeper, deeper examination. And I was thinking, like, what, what is it that drives us to where we are today? And the, thinking, the, the thing I was thinking is, is maybe we're all on a quest. We as humanity have this quest. And this quest has been ingrained into our DNA for thousands of years. What is this quest? It is a quest to experience and interact with captured and created realities. Think about it. The first time we do right. it, so what happened is, is imagine the first person that actually started to do this with captured reality at the caves, and it goes on and on and on and on, and it ends up with what we have today. And I kept it right now in this particular slide, and it ended on James Cameron, because I think this is one of the things that at least me, me had a pretty interesting epiphany when I saw Avatar and subsequently I'm work, we're working with him on some other VR projects in China is the fact that the technology is good enough at this point to create some pretty darn compelling realities. Rather it is recreated, captured, or imagined, it didn't matter. But the fact is it's pretty darn good. The computational power that's available for us today to go do that is here. And there's going to be a tremendous amount of breakthroughs and storytelling in the traditional form of filmmaking, TV, internet, so on and so forth. That is something that we all know. But we're at a crossroad. I thought it was a pretty interesting crossroad. And what is that crossroad in our quest? Is our decision to be either an observer or a participant. Seeing the past, when we go back to the other time, when you're looking at, when you're reading a book, when you're watching a movie, we're really a participant, even though the story narrative might be in first person. Well, if you're looking at Cloverfield, you're, you're, you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, from a first person handheld camera perspective, you know you're an observer. You're out there sitting in, in your, you know, if you're in a movie theater, sitting in your chair with your popcorn, you look over to your right or somebody there, where if not, it's an empty chair, you know that you can escape. There's always a mechanism for you to get out of that environment. Well, with virtual reality, it kind of takes that escapism away from you. It puts you into something of a participant. So what is it that we really want? I think what we really want is something we've seen before already. We've seen in the TV show Star Trek. I'm dating myself here because when I was putting this thing together, my wife goes, you do realize that was 20 years ago when, uh, when the holodeck was first introduced in the next generation. For those of you who, who, are, who saw this show in the U.S. And, of course, the movie Matrix where you're plugged in and you have full century and you don't even realize you're in this created reality. And, and that's what we really want. And the, but, but, but it's more than that. I think what we really want is a choice. In the prior world, in the, the film, TV world, you don't really have a choice. You are an observer. The director, the showrunner, they have full control of what you see and what you don't see. What you experience, what you don't experience. That is not the case anymore. You have choices. You have the choice to be in a scripted narrative or you can be in a construct. I just want to be on top of a mountain with birds, no story, I just want to be here. You have that choice. You have a choice to be first person or third person. You have that choice. You have the, per the choice of being in this alone or you can play with as many people and interact with as many people as you like. And you can make this into a very personal memory where you can share it with everybody. That's a choice that we face today. And this is, I think, where virtual reality and everything is taking us. And I, I put on there the virtual reality, AR and VR and AI is because I really believe that virtual reality alone is not going to help us make these choices. It's going to be the integration of AR 
with VR because none of us really like to be in that headset all the time, regardless of how good that experience is. We want to be able to see our hands. We don't necessarily want to have a phantom limb. We want to be able to, you know, have the choices of being in your automated driving, self-driving car, to be totally tuned out, or have the ability to have a semi-virtual reality experience. And of course, when you're in a free-form environment like this, the directors and the screenwriters and the showrunners are not going to be able to plan for every single details. That's where AI comes in, where these artificial intelligence, the, the machine learning component of creativity will be able to fill in the little blanks. That's where I think we're headed. And I think, you know, based on some of the, converse, the, the presentation yesterday, and I think we're, we're here today, I think we're getting closer. We've got a while to go, but I think we got a little bit closer. So that's my uh, couple minutes uh, chat on, the, on VR. Let me share with you a little bit on China. We can get the projector up again. Okay. So no matter how much you know, we practiced this last night, it's never, ever. So while we're doing this, uh, you know, we had a story. So when, we're, when I was at Microsoft, we have this thing. Back then in the old days, there's something called Com, uh, 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 these big CES events. And uh, Comdex, is used, they used to call them. And then what we tried to do was you know, we actually had to launch the event to launch our products back then. And then uh, I was in charge of this product as part of the Microsoft Office. And Bomber, Steve Bomber is going to come over and be our guest speaker and do the presentation and launch the event. Do we have everything up or are we not? Oh, we got to click it? So we're up? Okay, good. All right. So I'm, I won't tell you the story. You can ask me about it tonight at the bar. All right. So next thing, move on to China. So VR or Chinese characteristics. So this is something I want to make sure that I want to share with you because China is different. It's one of the most unique places on the face of the planet besides North Korea. I really think that the, 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 if you look at its history and everything, it is unique. It is one of the few places on the face of the planet that's never been colonized by a Western country, that from a religious perspective has never had been penetrated by the missionaries. It, re, it retained its own culture for five, over 5,000 years. It's also one of the few countries after World War II that did not have a foreign military presence like you have in Japan, Korea, or Eastern Europe. So, it retains a lot of that characteristics that it is today. So some of the things, first of all, it's huge. It's enormously huge as a market. Some of the stats here, I won't go through some of them, but you can go, you can look at some of this stuff. The population itself, the internet population itself, is about the size of Europe, the entire population of Europe. Just to give you an idea how big that size is. Okay, the second thing I want to sort of show you is everything you're familiar with on the internet probably doesn't exist in China. You want to Google it, not going to happen. You want to Facebook it, not going to happen. You like your Twitter, sorry Donald Trump, not going to happen. You want to watch a video on Netflix, not going to happen. So you have an environment, an entire environment, an entire market where there is a Chinese substitute for every single thing that you are familiar with. That drives tremendous amount of user and content disparity. You don't have a necessarily convergence. Sometimes you have actually a pretty big divergent. So for example, search. Search for one of the few things that actually converges. If you go to a Baidu, you look at a Baidu experience and the results, very similar to Google. But that's where it ends. When you do social, there's no Facebook. In China, they use something called WeChat. Everything socially is done on WeChat. WeChat has gotten so powerful that it can do commerce. They can do payments. You can pay your electric bills. You can go ahead and make banking transfer. You can go online shopping. I can book a movie ticket all on this thing called WeChat. Matter of fact, if you're a Chinese citizen, you can apply for visa uh, or for your, uh, for your, to renew your uh, government ID information on this WeChat. The government services all integrated into this social app called WeChat. It's an amazing thing. And you know what? Virtual reality is going to have to integrate with this. So you have some pretty interesting idea of how some of these things are, 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 are different. Uh, another thing I want to highlight out is actually the web store, uh, the app stores. So in the US and Europe, you get your app primarily from two places, right? You get your app from Google Play or Apple Store, uh, the, 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 the app store. In China, that's not the case. Most people get their apps actually from their mobile phones 
app stores, so Huawei app stores or, or Samsung app stores and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of third-party app stores that you download apps from. So the dominance of a single app store changes the, uh, changes the dynamic how you behave in the US and Europe. But when you go into China, those dominant app stores no longer exist. There's a different behavior regarding that. So the other thing about VR, um, I want to make sure I got everything on the other side right. OK. So this is, I think, very similar to, to the US and everywhere else. VR growth is influenced by headset, the experience centers, and content. So if you're a Chinese VR customer, you, what is it that you, you, when you, you know, experience VR with the first point of contact? In most cases, it's a relatively very inexpensive headset. There's a discussion I had with one of the attendants yesterday regarding is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think a couple uh, months ago, a year ago, it was a great thing. People were exposed to it. Now I'm not too sure because it leaves the mainstream audience with a distaste in their mouth. Wow, I tried it. It's really not that great. This is all I can do. So you have to win them back again. It makes it harder. And then the other thing is, is the VR Experience Center. One of the interesting things about China is taking place, I think one of the speakers alluded to yesterday, is a proliferation of something called VR Experience Centers. You go out there and you can play with it, you can watch content, and this thing is pretty pervasive. So you can go down to pretty rural parts of Chinese cities and you'll be able to touch these VR Experience Centers. So in many cases, the Chinese experience's first experience with VR it's not necessarily a lean back experience that you would have with an Oculus, I mean, with a, uh, with a Samsung where, where the cardboard. It's actually a lean forward experience where you're in the experience center, you're playing these games, you're interacting with it. So the, the, the proclivity for the Chinese VR customers, I think, with the audience, is to want to have that interaction, to want to have that engagement much, much more so than maybe in the US, especially when your first engagement is much more of a laid back experience. I want to watch things. I don't want to necessarily play with things. So I think that's something that's, uh, that, that's, that's happening. Um, the challenge, I think, with these internet experience center is that their current model uh, is not going to be sustainable. It's great as a novelty, but I think they missed out on the most important part of having an arcade with an experience center, and that is the fact that if you're in a VR and you're in this experience center, you won't be able to experience why we go to the VR, which is to listen to the crowd, listen to the, the, the aggregation of your fans cheering you on as you dance, as you, you know, hit the highest score. You're going to miss all that social element. So somehow or another, that learning experience has to integrate that piece into the, uh, into the offline experience. Um, the other thing is um, 360 isn't that big in China. Uh, so it's not as big as it is in the US, where it's driven by Facebook and, and, and uh, YouTube on the, on the uh, 360. There's not that many uh, growth of that. So that's something that uh, I'm not sure if that'll change, but that's something we're watching. Um, there's definitely been some move into 360, but that has not taken off as much as in the US. Um, the, the other thing is, is content quality. So one of the things that I experienced in the last year that I've been in China is the content quality of VR hasn't really vastly improved. In the US and in, in, in Europe, you have a lot of very renowned, I think, VR studios. You have Baobab, you have Penrose that we have here, uh, you have uh, Felix and Paul, you have Within, and so on and so forth. In China, that's yet to be developed. That's yet to be developed. And that's why I think one of John's aspiration is to be the China version of that particular world-renowned VR studio. And the last thing is the what we're thinking, is, what I've been seeing in the last, probably in the last three to four months, is there's a pickup, there's a pretty big pickup in the hardware market in terms of cameras and headset. So those are some of the things that are, are happening in China that, that, may, that may hopefully uh, you, you find interesting. Here's why I'm bullish up about, about the market. There's two things that's happening. One, and that's, this is global. One is Daydream. In China, it would be Daydream or equivalent experiences because there's no Google Play. So it would be some version of that that has all the, 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 the attributes of, 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 uh, of Daydream without the Google Play component. Um, and uh, it will not be necessarily driven 100% by Google devices. Second thing is uh, the launch of the uh, Microsoft so VR headset for Windows 10. Why is that important is because when you have a mobile population of about 695 million people and about 70% of those mobile devices gets replaced every year, what you'll have to see is, is that pretty soon you're going to have 100 million of these daydream equivalent devices. They could happen as soon as the end of 2018. I think one of the speakers yesterday was, had his 100 million mark on, on his slide. I laughed because you know, I, I had the same number. Is, is we're going to hit that critical mass pretty darn quick in China. And then on top of that, when you have a huge 
pretty large PC gaming driven uh, economy that's going to have the headset, you're going to have a pretty large adoption, pretty very, very rapidly. And what that means is, is it creates a tremendous amount of scale for your hardware guys, for your content and your game to develop the really, really great content that's required to drive this market. So I'm really, really bullish about this, this market. That's why, that's why we're in China. So next thing I'm going to go really quick is uh, to introduce you to Jaunt. Some of you have, uh, may not know about Jaunt. I'm going to go through this really quick. But if you're in the VR world, chances are you already know who we are. We have this camera uh, that's pretty, pretty kick-ass uh, you know, camera. We, we think it's the, the best camera you have in the market today. We can do 100 frame, uh, 120 frames per second at 12K. We have amazing low-light resolution. Uh, the picture we have here, if they can get it up, shows you the, what we did at Burning Man at, at, the, at such a low-light resolution with, such, with very low noise. Uh, we've been working with a lot of producers and directors and cinematographers in China and in Asia, uh, especially when they have low-light requirements or with very complicated lighting requirements. Uh, this camera has been, is it's absolutely amazing. The other thing that we have is a, uh, we, we're the only one with a cloud-based rendering and stitching uh, and post-production uh, uh, workflow. So just give you an idea of what we're able to do uh, from, a, from a cloud perspective. We run on AWS in the US and the rest of the world. We run on AWS also in China. Um, and uh, we have this amazing ability to do our rendering, stitching, and also workflow uh, on, on, on the web. So the other thing is, is that we do is you may already know a lot of this is you know we work with uh, amazing creators all over the world on the um, production and distribution of content. So one of our uh, some of our unique production is us, uh, with uh, Paul McCartney and also with Doug Lyman on the Invisible series. And of course, we just announced at the uh, Sundance uh, our, our uh, taking on the revival of a uh, lawnmower man, making that into a, a VR movie. So that's something that we're very excited about. We're very, uh, very uh, pleased to see. And the uh, last thing I want to sort of, the last two slides I want to show you really quick is uh, John China. So, introduce you to John China. We were formed uh, officially in February, is the first joint venture in China for virtual reality. We're the only country, company in the world, uh, in China right now, that can uh, shoot, produce, distribute content uh, globally in China. And the last thing I want to introduce you is, is what our focus is. My focus is why I'm here. It's about content. My, my biggest focus and my biggest passion is about content and creativity, creating uh, amazing uh, storytelling content for, for VR. These are some of the areas that we're focusing in on online, offline experiences, uh, working with interactivity, including motions, gestures, uh, cognitive flow, integration with games, uh, activation within VR experience. You can actually do something that, uh, that, that uh, drives an all offline or, or another web uh, uh, activity, and then also social elements. So these are the things that we're very excited about. And if you have, and we have a, a, a fund that we also pr provide for co-production uh, financing and equipment rentals. So if you have any ideas that you think would be interesting for us in the China or the global market, happy to have a conversation with you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.